3D printing has had an incredible impact on our ability as individuals to create stuff. Additive manufacturing, as it's otherwise known, has found its way into maker spaces, hacker spaces, university spaces, and homes all around the world, and people are doing incredible things with this technology. However, when you put these delicate machines in the hands of those who don't know how to use them, well, they break badly. And I've personally seen this many times. In my past, I used to install 3D printers in schools and then subsequently have to go in and repair them again and again. And I've been in maker spaces and seen firsthand just how destroyed a 3D printer can become when someone tries to do things on it without the prior knowledge. So I thought it'd be a valuable video to share with you the most common ways these machines get broken in spaces like this and how you can mitigate it. And if you're just brand new to 3D printing yourself, how you yourself can avoid these common problems. Let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse. So I recently posted on Twitter asking people who use these public maker spaces, hacker spaces and the like, what's the most common way that their 3D printers get broken? As I said, I have a lot of experience myself seeing firsthand these machines get destroyed by those who don't really know what they're doing. But I also reached out to the community for their input and I'll be sharing that in this video. So let's start with the, I would say number one cause of failure for 3D printers in a public space. People slicing models with the wrong settings. So this is how it usually goes. Someone will come up to a 3D printer and they'll be somewhat ignorant of the fact that when you slice G-code for 3D printing, it needs to be specifically sliced for that printer. That is the right print volume in mind, the right filament you're using, the right temperatures, feeds, speeds, and custom G-code that that machine may use. And as you would know, if you have a 3D printer, there's so many things that can go wrong during this stage. And usually 3D printers will just take that G-code in and try to print it and fail. And the damage caused by this can vary. So for example, if they try to use ABS plastic at PLA printing temperatures within the slicer, then the machine probably will jam up because the temperature is too low in the hot end. But even if it does extrude, the print bed will not be at ABS printing temperatures. It's very difficult to keep ABS stuck down at the best of times. So it'll most likely detach, warp up. And if they walk away from the printer without watching that first layer go down, which is the number two cause of problems, then it's gonna cause a huge amount of damage. It causes the blob of death that's around the hot end. And then once that cools, it usually takes out the nozzle, the thermistor, the heater cartridge, the cooling fan, it does a lot of damage. And I would say it's the number one reason for 3D printers ending up with this failure. Something else you might see is people slicing with the wrong filament diameter set in their slicer. For example, the default Cura profile will have that 2.85 millimeter diameter, whereas many other machines on the market are 1.75 millimeters diameter. This isn't so much gonna cause that ball of death usually, but it'll end up with a really crap looking print due to the, uh, the over extrusion that the machine will do. Uh, or under extrusion, depending which way you go. So that's also another thing I often see. So if you're responsible for these public printers, how do you mitigate this? Well, you have to do an induction, absolutely. But I highly recommend having a dedicated PC at the site of the 3D printer with your slicing software and a profile that works. And if you can lock it so people can't change anything, you have to slice at what we've chosen because we know it works. No tweaking, no tinkering, unless they come to you and ask for a very specific use case. For example, support material help because their file is somewhat complicated and they might need a brim to help with adhesion, stuff like that. But in general, I would say the best way to solve this is to have a dedicated profile setting at a dedicated computer and it's never allowed to be changed. Number two, setting up a 3D print and then walking away. And this feeds into number one, when things can go wrong. But this also has a few additional uh, factors involved. For example, the printer might not have been used for some time and the print bed may be dusty. It may be greasy from greasy fingerprints touching it. It might be dirty, which very much decreases bed adhesion. So although a 3D printer might have worked three months ago, if it's been left in a somewhat dusty or dirty environment, I've seen schools with 3D printers in the woodwork shop. Why? Anyway, that means their first layer is probably not gonna stick. And the best way to make sure your print's gonna succeed is to watch those first few layers go down, keep an eye on it, and if they come free, stop the print and avoid 
the big ball of death clogging up the hot end. So if people just set a print at night and then walk away and leave the printer for six hours unattended, it's a death sentence more often than not. The mitigation for this is to drill into their heads that they have to watch the print go down or unfortunately, a lot of these places, these workshops and makerspaces have someone on hand at all times that's constantly orbiting around the space and watching these machines to make sure if there is a failure, they'll catch it early. Number three, students or individuals bringing in their own filament, whether it be exotic filament or the cheapest PLA they could find on eBay. Either way, this is a surefire way to destroy the machine. Because let's be real, there are so many different types of filament on the market that dialing in a specific type is really challenging for someone who's experienced with 3D printers. So how is a newcomer going to be able to do it? And my advice for this is to ban external filaments. Uh, I know it sounds like it's really harsh, but if you have known good filament in the shop that students or individuals can then rebuy from you and use for their print, then it's gonna save you a heck of a lot of pain because you know that filament will work with the profile that you've set up and that the print will succeed. And here's a few justifications why. For example, people will bring in glow in the dark filament because they want something to glow. That filament usually has abrasive particles in it, but not many people know that, and it'll eat through the brass nozzle, just like carbon filled filaments will. Uh, and that's another example. Carbon filled nylon is such an attractive filament to people who are new to 3D printing. Because they're like, what's the strongest filament I can 3D print on this machine? Unfortunately, not many machines can 3D print nylon at the best of times, and especially carbon filled which is abrasive and also has the issues of printing nylon it's hygroscopic absorbs moisture bubbles and spits uh, warps like ABS except even worse it's difficult to print most machines can't do it and I would advise keeping it out of a shared 3d printing environment unless that machine is dedicated to printing nylons and high temperature filaments like the Chidi Tech X Plus I reviewed not too long ago you could make that a dedicated nylon filament printer but even then I would recommend keeping the nylon on site in a dry room and making the students buy the filament for their prints. <laughs> and if you allow people to bring in their own filament, inevitably they will go for the cheapest source, which is usually very poor uh, diameter accuracy. And that will lead to crappy prints at the best of times and at the worst of times clog up the hot end and re result in a offline 3D printer for God knows how long. And that takes us to uh, number four, people who try to fix 3D printers who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> a great example of that is removing a nozzle. So if 3D printers clog, nozzles do clog. Sometimes there's dust on the, on the roll that accumulates inside. Sometimes the heat break gets too hot because of the heat creep from that hot end. And if the machine's left to preheat for a long time, like we'll get to that, uh, that can cause the filament to jam in it and all sorts of issues. If people go in to try to fix something they don't know anything about, it usually results in something I've seen way too often. Snapping the nozzle off at the heat break. That's right, people will try to undo a nozzle when the machine is cold. Uh, so they'll get the wrench, they'll wrench on it thinking, oh, I just need a little bit more force. And they don't realize that heat break is very thin walled metal because it's trying to reduce that heat creep. It's very weak. It's not designed for wrenching force. They'll just snap the nozzle clean off. And once that's done, the machine is ruined until you can get a whole new hot end assembly, which is a real, real pain in the ass if you're running these machines. So make sure to mitigate this, no one is ever allowed to do these things. Uh, unless they are someone who is very well experienced with 3D printers and they know what's going on, they are not allowed to change nozzles, they're not allowed to do any maintenance or tweaking on a machine because they're more than likely going to ruin the printer beyond what was actually damaged in the first place and then that machine will be offline for who knows how long, which just affects everyone else in the space. It's such a pain and I've seen it so many times. And also, I just personally, they should be responsible for any damage they cause, but that's just me. I don't know if that's even possible to enforce in your space. And leading on from the nozzle jamming and the heat creep issue is preheating forever. So people will preheat and then get distracted and walk away and do something else. Now, luckily a lot of modern 3D printers will have a timeout for preheating. They'll stop preheating after a period of time, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Even then that's sometimes enough to cause the filament to jam up in the, the throat of the hot end. But I, I have a quick story to tell. Um, a 3D printer I had some time ago, I lent out to a student, a high school student, and um, he was very, he's very clever, but it was left to preheat in the morning and then he went to school. 
and I didn't know the machine would just stay preheating the whole day, like eight hours. This machine was preheating. Not only is that a huge fire risk, but it completely cooked the hot end assembly. Everything was ruined. In terms of mitigating this, I'm not really sure what you could do because you need to preheat to load and unload filament. But if you're doing an induction, just hammer it in that if you're preheating a machine, don't walk away from it. Stay there for like the few minutes it takes, do your process and then finish up and then leave after watching the first few layers go down if you are printing. Uh, because when, when the machines preheat, the filament just cooks in that hot end and it can just jam the entire thing up. And not only that, it's a fire hazard as well. Um, I'm, I, I stopped loaning printers out to people like that after that incident because I was terrified if something worse had happened than the machine just breaking itself. These next few issues are more symptoms of the others I've already talked about, but they're still very important to discuss. And one of them is outdated and bad adhesion methods. So what will happen is a print won't stick and the student or individual will try to solve it themselves by looking up information. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, 3D printing has evolved very quickly, but there's a lot of information on the internet that's completely outdated and one of them is usually adhesion methods. So uh, in the examples that people on Twitter gave me, people will start sticking painter's tape down onto the bed to try to build a platform the print can stick to. People will spray hairspray all over the printer bed, but also all over the printer in the process. They'll layer, layer, layer glue stick and stuff down, all in the vain hope of sticking that first layer down, when really the print bed just needed a good clean with some water and maybe a little bit of methylated spirits, that's what I like to do, and maybe a little bit of glue stick, depending on what sort of surface it is, if it's like just glass or something. But often people will try to solve it with just ridiculous methods that cause more issues than they solve. I've, uh, I've been at a space where someone was using super glue to try to keep the corners of their print stuck down as the print was going, because it was warping up, because the print bed wasn't properly prepared. Uh, yeah, ridiculous, right? But people will do dumb things like that when they don't know any better. So my advice here is to make sure that print bed is perfectly clean if, if you're able to do it as like a job or drum into the heads in an induction that if the 3D prints aren't sticking, it's not that the 3D printer gods hate you, it's that something's not right. Whether your settings are wrong, your filament's not right, or the print bed needs cleaning or re-leveling. Here we go. This is one of my favorites and most hated things with public 3D printers. Removing the print from the print bed. Um, and I just have to share this tweet about someone grabbing onto the print of an Ultimaker and uh, it was stuck down obviously very well and then lifting the Ultimaker up by the print. Unfortunately, I can believe this because with 3D printing, you want stuff stuck down, obviously, so it doesn't warp off the bed, but at the end, you want to be able to remove it. So many people just manhandle that print and in the process can damage the printer, they can damage the print bed and throw the printer out of level by doing that and probably damage the print surface as well. So when this happens and they try to print something else again, often the print level will be wrong and they'll dig the nozzle into the print bed or they'll, they'll be too far away and they'll walk away and again, another symptom of it, the print will just make that ball of death because the print delaminated or fell off the print bed during the printing process. So I would recommend for peace of mind, if you have a 3D printer in a location like this where people are using it that might not be knowledgeable, get a removable print surface. There is no reason now not to have one. There are spring steel ones like the Prusa Mark III has with the PEI sheet. You take it off, flex it, and it just pops off. There are flexible magnetic surfaces like the Easy Peelzy that come off. There are so many different ones. Most printers now come with them, but if you don't have one, you can easily retrofit them. And it's very easy to teach that you just let the printer cool down. You remove the magnetic print sheet, give it a flex, Maybe use a spatula very carefully to just make sure there's no little strings or brims or whatever left on it. Put it back on, make sure there's no dust on the print bed underneath the magnetic sheet and hit print again. The bed level is not ruined, the nozzle height is not ruined and if you, if by any random freak chance they ruin that print surface, it's removable. It's a magnetic sheet so you can just get have another one spare and throw it on. So that's my advice for mitigating that because yeah, I have seen people just grab prints and rip them off the print bed. And that makes me physically uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't believe people are malicious or intentionally negligent when it comes to breaking these machines. I think it's, um, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's sort of just to very briefly summarize, it's where people can be completely ignorant 
of a topic, but therefore are very confident about that topic. And the more they learn about it, the more they realize that they actually know nothing about that topic and their confidence greatly drops. So I think that's got something to do with people coming against 3D printers because the media is partly to blame here. Media makes 3D printing looks, look like magic. It's like you just press a button and out comes a 3D model when it's really not like that at all. So I think that's something to do with people breaking printers in public spaces. I don't think it's done with uh, any sort of nefarious or negligent intent. I think it's just people don't know any better. So with good induction and good education to get them past that newbie newbie level and just a little bit of knowledge and a good system in place, I think those machines will last a lot longer. So that's gonna do this video. Thank you everyone on Twitter for sharing your experiences and helping me relive the pain of running spaces like this and going into schools and being like, oh, hello, why is your 3D printer in your woodworking shop? Uh, I think the nozzle's jammed because it's full of sawdust. Yeah. If you run a 3D printing space with public printers where people can use them like students or maybe individuals at a makerspace, I would love to hear your experiences on what goes wrong and how you mitigate it in the comments below because you'll definitely help out people by sharing it. I do appreciate it as well. I love to read it and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts as well. And if you did enjoy this video on Makers Muse, then maybe consider subscribing because it's my aim to empower your creativity because then maybe you can keep these machines running to empower the creativity of others and this beautiful cycle can keep repeating. Thanks for watching guys, bye.